My name is John Bentz, and I'm uh, chairman of ACG Chicago Awards Committee. And I, my day job is managing director of Valuation Research Corporation here in Chicago. I'm here to present uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award to Mr. Jack Levin, senior managing partner at Kirkland and Ellis. And after my introductory remarks, uh, Jack will be joined up here with his uh, partner, Richard Porter, for a uh, small little Q&A session, which will be uh, very enjoyable. Last week, I had the opportunity to have lunch with Jack, and it was a fascinating two hours. And I can honestly say that this uh, award should be called a lifetime of achievements um, with Jack. And I'm going to read some of those achievements to you, and I think you will, you, you will all agree. So I want to give a little uh, background on Jack's personal life and his professional career um, before I hand him the award. Uh, Jack grew up on the west side of Chicago near Madison and Kedzie, where his grandfather started a restaurant called Little Jack's. And for 50 years, Jack's grandfather, father, and their family uh, owned and operated uh, this restaurant near Madison and Kedzie on the west side of Chicago. Jack went to Northwestern University and graduated in 1958. He also passed the CPA exam with a gold medal in 1958, and then went on to Harvard Law School, where he graduated number one in his class in 1961. He then spent three months at Kirkland and Ellis here in Chicago and decided to go to New York City and be a law clerk for the New York City Federal Court of Appeals in the Second District. He was also the assistant to the uh, Solicitor General of the United States under Archibald Cox and Thurgood Marshall. Jack was a litigator and before the age of 31, he led trials in appellate counsel for three U.S. District Court trials, 12 U.S. Court of Appeal arguments, and eight, that's right, eight U.S. Su Supreme Court arguments, all before the age of 31. Currently, Jack has four Lifetime Achievement Awards, and in a few minutes, he's going to be receiving his fifth. The four that he has currently on the shelves uh, in the year 2000, he uh, received the American Jewish Committee's Learned Hand Award for contributions to the legal profession and the community presented by U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. In December of 2002, the Illinois Venture Capital Association recognized Jack for service to the private equity and venture capital community, and this award was presented to him by then-Senator Barack Obama. In 2005, Chambers and Partners Global Attorney Lifetime Achievement Award was granted to Jack for pioneering legal work in the private equity venture capital presented in London by the UK Prime Minister Tony Blair's spouse. And then finally in 2005, the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center Humanitarian of the Year Award was presented to Jack. He has represented basically the, who, the who's who in corporate America as well as in the private equity world. He has 20 different distinctions. I'm going to read you eight of them. He's a member of the Illinois State Treasurer's Advisory Board on Technology Venture Capital Investments from 2004 to present. Present. He was on the advisor. He was an advisor on the business and equity taxation to President Bush's tax reform panel in 2005. Midwest co-chair of Harvard Law School's capital campaign, 04 to 08. Chairman of Harvard Law School, National Fundraising Drives, class of 1961, 25th anniversary, the 30th anniversary, the 35th anniversary, and the 40th anniversary. American Jewish Committee's National Board of Governors, 05 to present, as well as the Chicago Chapter's Board of Directors, 02 to present, and the Executive Committee member, 03 to present. American College of Tax Council, Chairman American Bar Association Subcommittee on Taxation of Corporate Distributions, 1996 to 1979. Chicago Federal Tax Forum, Chairman, 1986 and 1987. Jack is also a college professor. He taught at Northwestern University. He taught at DePaul. And currently, he teaches at Harvard Law School and the University of Chicago Law School. He does not have to go far for the texts in these classes because Jack has written three books. One that is used not only by him, 
but also universities throughout the U.S. That book is called Structuring Venture Capital, Private Equity, and Entrepreneurial Transactions. It's 1,400 pages long, and it's updated annually. Jack has also written over 100 articles and chapters and books on the similar subject matter of private equity and venture capital. He has lectured at dozens of university events, seminars, and conferences, and he has testified before Congress many times. Lastly, um, the last time was on the tax issues of carried interests and how it affects private equity. Now some of Jack's personal background. At 74, Jack is an avid skier, tennis player, and traveler. Jack's wife of 52 years, Sandy, is sitting to his left. Sandy, could you stand up? <laughs> Sandy met Jack on a blind date. And that was uh, several years ago. They've been married for 52 years. They have four daughters, two of here tonight, two of which are here tonight. Uh, the second daughter is Laura. Laura, could you stand up? And the fourth daughter is Linda. She is here as well. Linda, could you stand up? There's ten grandchildren in Jack and Sandy's life. I've met several um, colleagues and partners of Jack's over the last number of years, and I think they all have told me that he is a very deserving recipient of this award. And he's, uh, for them, he's been an unbelievable inspiration, a mentor, and a teacher. Some view Jack, many of people in this room, as the father of private equity, and I don't think there'd be too many people that would disagree with that. One past colleague told me that he was one of the greatest legal minds of his generation. Another colleague told me that one of the reasons why he left his old firm was to join Kirkland and Ellis and be in the same office as Jack Levin in Chicago. So on behalf of ACG Chicago, everyone in this room, your colleagues, your clients, your family, and myself, it is an honor and a privilege to present you with the ACG Chicago Lifetime Achievement Award. Jack Levin. John, I, I guess based on what you were saying that you're going to be either president or prime minister after giving Jack the award, is that right? <laughs> based on that list? Richard, let me make two introductory comments, if I might. First, I very much appreciate this generous Lifetime Achievement Award from an organization of ACG stature. But I do take note that everyone, everyone who receives a Lifetime Achievement Award inevitably has one unfortunate characteristic in common. They're all old, since they've already suffered through a lifetime of achievements. Second, I certainly don't deserve this award. As will become clear from the remarks that I'm about to deliver, I am, you made me, my career sound far better than it really was. <clears throat> so Richard, ACG told me that I am required by the terms of this generous award to answer your questions fully and truthfully. So Leon McDuff and Dan be him who first cries hold enough. <clears throat> well, Jack. John described you as um, the father of private equity, and I've, I've heard that before, and it's something we like to think about you as well. So it's one of the reasons why I came to Kirkland and Ellis, because you were here. But uh, I thought maybe it might make uh, some sense to add a little color around the story that John sketched out, your life story. It's a, it's a fun story. And I want to go back to Garfield Park, uh, back there at Little Jack's, where the politicians used to hang out, as I understand. It was kind of a political hangout on the west side of Chicago. <laughs> and I want to know, when you were a little kid running around those tables, was it your game plan to become a father of private equity? Well, originally, Richard, I dreamed of a career in professional sports. But as the other kids grew far bigger and stronger, those thoughts quickly faded. However, 
because my local high school on Chicago's west side was a bit subpar. My parents shipped me off for high school to St. John's Military Academy in Delafield, Wisconsin, where I learned about per perseverance and dedication, was awarded a presidential appointment to West Point, and decided to become a general in the American Army. A few weeks before I was scheduled to start at West Point, my father, concerned about that particular career path for me, told me he had three questions about my budding military career. First, he said, I thought you didn't want to go to school anymore without girls. I said, damn, I, res I forgot. Second, he said, I thought you wanted to make a lot of money. Double damn, I responded. I forgot about that, too. Third, he said, do you know a lot of short, unathletic Jewish generals in the American Army? <laughs> no, I responded. Well, he said, don't worry. Perhaps you'll be the first. So I pondered his three questions for a day or two and then asked him what he would suggest I do if I opted not to attend West Point. He responded that becoming a CPA and then a lawyer sounded like a good idea. And so within a few weeks, I was on my way to Northwestern University where I majored in accounting, passed the CPA exam the month I graduated, and then headed to Harvard Law School. Well, I, there's a little color around that story. I, I think that, uh, if I remember correctly, Jack was valedictorian at St. John's, which none of us ever referred to you as Napoleonic, by the way, so <laughs> don't worry about that. But uh, first in his class at St. John's, which probably you know, uh, derived from the fact that he was the best marcher at St. John's, <laughs> but then also first of his class at Northwestern, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then it was off to Harvard, where I'm sure all those pointy-headed Harvard people were very impressed with this, uh, as I always say, diminutive Midwestern uh, gold medal winner. Well, Richard, my 550 new Harvard Law classmates were the cream of the crop. Top students from the best undergraduate schools in the nation, debate champions, Rhodes Scholars, Fulbright Scholars. It was very intimidating. And at lunch most days, they would poke fun and ask how the product of a Midwestern undergraduate business school could possibly hope to compete at the Ivy League's top law school. Well, so your gold medal was impressive to them then, Jack? Is that right? <laughs> um, they weren't impressed, and in all honesty, I think the grading of the CPA exams in those days was probably a bit sloppy. Okay. Well, so at Harvard, uh, I. Uh, Jack's streak of being number one continued. He was first in his class every year at Harvard and then was one of the editors on the Law Review. And uh, where to go from there, Jack? Well, at Harvard Law School, I decided that I wanted to go into tax law. That was natural for a person who was a CPA. So I took all the co tax courses offered at Harvard. But as three years of law school passed, a whole new vista opened to me. It was called litigation. My God, why confine yourself to a stultifying area like tax law and business law when you could be a litigator, like those hero lawyers that you saw on TV? So after a law school graduation, I first joined Kirkland & Ellis, which was primarily a litigation firm then. And after a few months, I moved from Chicago to New York City, as John mentioned to serve as a law clerk for the chief judge of the Federal Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in New York. And I became thoroughly immersed in litigation. I mean, one day it was civil, then criminal, then antitrust, then constitutional issues. It was heady stuff. And a year later, when I returned to Kirkland Chicago office, I announced I am going to be a litigator. And I spent the next three years working on all kinds of litigation shareholder suits, fraud suits, conspiracy suits, antitrust, bond indenture litigation, and even a political reapportionment case that resulted in the statewide election, the only statewide election that I know of, of the, enti of the entire House of Representatives here in Illinois. So your, your brush with politics, that led you to, to uh, being a private equity lawyer? Was well, the... not yet. After my three years at Kirkland, as John mentioned, a Harvard Law School professor named Archibald Cox, who was then serving as Solicitor General of the United States at the Department of Justice in Washington, 
and was later, you'll recall, to serve as the Richard Nixon impeachment prosecutor, called and asked me to come to Washington to be his assistant and to argue the government's tax and business cases to the U.S. Supreme Court. And then when Mr. Cox returned to Harvard Law School, I remained at the Solicitor General's office under the new Solicitor General, Thurgood Marshall. It was a great experience. Over the two-year period, as John mentioned, I argued eight cases to the U.S. Supreme. I gave, argued 12 cases to the Federal Court of Appeals all over the country. And I tried three cases in the federal district courts. So Thurgood Marshall, Marshall, he was the source of your interest in private equity, is that? Well, not quite yet. It, it wasn't time yet. <laughs> At that point, six years out of law school, I did indeed decide to return to Kirkland in Chicago, but not as a litigator. By then, I had concluded that litigation was not the right approach for me. Litigators generally jump, as those of you who are lawyers here know, from one subject to another. And I trust one day, conspiracy, fraud, reapportionment, constitutional law, the next, not really developing any particular substantive expertise. Also, litigators, like fifth grade boys on the school playground, constantly argue with each other about everything. Service of process, jurisdiction, discovery, attorney-client privilege, motion to dismiss, summary judgment, and only after years of such hand-to-hand -hand combat do they actually turn to the merits or substance of the case. Now, it was all great fun, but I concluded that I was more substantively oriented and less interested in all the courtroom theatrics and procedures. So I returned to Kirkland as a tax lawyer. And for three years, I studied very lengthy tax regulations, tax cases, and IRS rulings, and proposed beautiful and outrageous tax um, transa transaction outlines for Kirkland deals. But all too often, the corporate lawyers to whom I gave my sophisticated transaction plans came back from each meeting saying that my tax plan was far too complex, and hence they had abandoned it. That, that never happens, Jack. I'm, I'm sure of that today, right? So after three years as a tax lawyer, I decided that being a tax lawyer was a bit too theoretical and that I actually wanted to be a transactional corporate lawyer so I could negotiate my own business plans. And so for the next several years, I worked as a corporate lawyer, forming new business enterprises, handling acquisitions by one business of another business, preparing executive compensation agreements, doing <coughs> SEC securities regulations and the like, working mainly with large stock exchange companies, now, by then, let's see where we were. We had reached the mid-1970s. Why do you think the mid-1970s were significant? I was 14 years out of law school. I was again getting bored, despairing of ever finding a really interesting substantive area of the law in which to work. When a miracle occurred, God unleashed on America a whole new business and legal area. It was the dawn of the venture capital private equity age. Before then, most businesses were able to raise money only if they were of industrial quality. That is, only if they were already sufficiently successful to be able to borrow from a conservative bank or sell SEC registered stock through a conservative underwriter. Thus, the American business climate in the mid 70s was definitely not entrepreneurial. So let's just survey for a minute the verbal landscape in the mid-70s. At that time, the words venture and capital did not go together. There was no such phrase as venture capital. Similarly, the words private and equity were never spoken together. Indeed, the whole area now known as VC, or venture capital, or private equity, PE, was then simply called risk capital by the approximately one dozen people in the United States who had ever heard of making risk-oriented equity investments. And certainly no one outside the U.S. had even contemplated such a concept. Also, no one had ever spoken the phrase leverage buyout, or LBO. Similarly, in those days, the only issuers of bonds 
were industrial rated companies. The concept of junk bonds or high yield bonds that is debt issued by a non-industrial rated company and bearing a high interest rate to compensate the holder for the higher risk of non-payment, especially to finance a young expanding company or a leveraged acquisition was absolutely unheard of. And finally, the words fund and formation did not constitute a, a phrase because no fund had ever been formed. So how did you get in this business? Then? Well, one day a top executive at First National Bank of Chicago, you remember First National Bank of Chicago, don't you? It's now part of J.P. Morgan Chase, called a Kirkland senior partner, said that First Chicago's fledgling risk investment unit was thinking of investing $500,000. Now that was a lot of money in those days in a startup manufacturing company and asked if Kirkland could send over its top risk investment attorney. So the Kirkland senior partner convened a meeting of several high-ranking Kirkland partners and asked, what's risk investing? Well, no one knew. But one wag suggested that Kirkland should send Levin because he doesn't know much about anything but he does know a little bit about a lot of things, having been a litigator, a tax lawyer, a transactional corporate lawyer, and a government lawyer. So the next morning, I met with Stan Golder of First Chicago, who was ultimately to become one of the US's legendary venture capital private equity investors, and ultimately to serve as president of both national trade associations for VC and PE professionals, that's NASVIC and NVCA. Now, Stan told me, when I got there, that we were about to negotiate a risk investment with the CEO and CFO of a startup company who were in the next room. Our relationship got off to a really good start. When I said to Stan, so what's risk investing? He responded by slapping himself on the forehead, loudly asking why Kirkland had sent him a dummy and telling me that when we go into the next room, I shouldn't under any circumstances say a single word. Then he handed me a two-page form that looked like a pre-printed lease on long paper with blanks to be filled in. And he told me that this was First Chicago's standard risk investment agreement. So all I had to do was keep quiet, take notes, and fill in the blanks. So after two and a half hours meeting with the target company, each side retired to lunch separately, which was when I said to Stan Golder that he wasn't really so smart himself. Offended, he looked at me and said, why? I said, well, your form agreement doesn't actually grant you any of the key rights you just spent two and a half hours demanding. And also the type of securities the form agreement would give you that is a preferred stock with a warrant, lacked most of the tax, SEC, and creditor's rights characteristics that you could obtain with a convertible debenture. So Stan, mildly impressed, responded, OK, let's try it your way. After lunch, you handle the rest of the negotiations, and then write me a new agreement overnight documenting the deal. Well, after that, I did all of First Chicago's risk investing deals. Uh, the only part of that story I don't find believable is that he kept quiet for the first two and a half hours. <laughs> I don't, I, it doesn't, doesn't fly with me. So where's it go from there, Jack? We have First Chicago. Uh, Stan Golder's now a client. Where do you go from there? Well, within a short time, Stan Golder co-invested in a deal with Continental Illinois' risk investing unit. You remember Continental Illinois, now part of Bank of America. And soon I was doing all of Continental's deals. Then a few younger executives jumped from First Chicago and from Continental to other places, including New York and California financial institutions. And we began doing risk investing work for all of those institutions. Now, by then, risk investing had become venture capital. The phrase had begun to blossom. And although the, pri the phrase private equity, meaning later stage risk investing, was still several years away. So, Jack, where did it go from there? So you had now, at this point, Chicago and Continental. Um, 
When did the industry start to move away from the institutional uh, client base towards uh, more private entrepreneurial funds the way we see it today? Well, the first big shift was when three smart guys named Kohlberg, Kravis, and Roberts were thinking about leaving Bear Stearns to form a private fund with money to be raised from investors. Now, Bear Stearns found out they were con contacting potential investors, including for Chicago and Continental, my clients, without having first told Bear Stearns. And Bear Stearns fired them and abruptly locked them out of the office. So the new KKR called First Chicago and Continental in hopes of getting a quick equity infusion into their new fund. And I represented First Chicago and Continental in making their equity investment into KKR's new fund. And it wasn't much later when my good friend by then, Stan Golder, actually left First Chicago and I helped him form Golder Toma Cressy Rauner, now called GTCR, Chicago's first private equity venture capital fund. Now that was the beginning of thousands of PEVC funds that we at Kirkland have formed over the last 30 years. Shortly thereafter came the first of several leveraged buyout or LBO booms where we represented entrepreneurial PE investors acquiring thousands of businesses with purchase prices beginning at a few million dollars and building up into the billions as the magnitude of private equity and LBO activity blossomed. Jack, uh, it's still clear here, 35 years later, you're still turned on by this business. Now, uh, tell me, what, what about it was exciting? But not not as much as by Sandy. That's true. That's true. Um, well, I'll tell you, I found the private equity venture capital business very satisfying. It allowed me to combine my tax planning experience with my later experience implementing complex business plans and to get more involved in correlating the business, legal, tax, and structuring aspects of transactions. To work with the best and brightest business minds, initially all over the US, and more recently as venture capital and private equity spread worldwide all over the world. For me, it was certainly more satisfying than being a litigator. See, I always thought of litigation as writing history, that is, describing past events, but thought of sophisticated private equity transactions as making history, that is, actually creating the historic events that a litigator might later write about if there were a dispute. It was also more satisfying than being a specialist in an area such as tax or SEC because I was responsible for structuring and effectuating the entire transaction. Finally, my relationship to a venture capital or private equity deal, where I typically work with just two or three very sophisticated venture capital <coughs> private equity professionals, some of whom are sitting out there at these tables and I appreciate their coming, was far more intimate than when I represented a large New York Stock Exchange client with layers of executives and committees through which I had to report. So Jack, now, uh, how, is your, how has your work changed on a day-to-day -day basis? What are you doing uh, in the private equity business today? Well, what's kept it fresh and vibrant for me is that so many things have changed over the years. Originally, we did small venture investments, as I talked about, perhaps 500000 to a million dollars per deal. And I was the only Kirkland lawyer doing these risk investments. Later, as venture capital m matured into private equity, we began to do a much wider variety of deals, things that are exciting. You're going to just marvel at these great things. Fund formations, leverage buyouts, turnaround investments to restructure financially troubled companies, exit scenarios, IPOs, sale of our portfolio company to a larger company, bankruptcy of our over-leveraged portfolio company. And the nature of the legal work changed as the U.S. went through four or five economic roller coasters, from boom to bust and back again. And as the size of the deal went from thousands to millions to billions, 
And as the number of attorneys in our private equity group at Kirkland went from one, me, spending perhaps 20% of my time on risk capital, to approximately 425 now, some of whom were kind enough to come and sit out there. And from 100% Chicago lawyers to a worldwide network of attorneys in nine offices on three continents. And for several years before 2007, before this terrible recession started, and I predict again after this year, when the recession is over. After Obama's out of office. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> there, there were, and I believe there will be, no limit on the amount of venture capital and private equity money available to smart people who have innovative ideas. So yes, I've been thrilled for the last 35 years with the challenges that I faced every day at the office. So I guess, Jack, I was getting a slightly different question, which was, are you still kind of hanging out, working on all those contracts, you know, working on reps and warranties late in the night, or are you doing, what are you up to now? Well, after a few years building Kirkland's private equity venture capital practice, I began to branch out and do a few other things. The dean of the University of Chicago Law School asked if I could suggest a novel topic on which U of C could build a practically oriented transactional law course. Back in those days, there were no practically oriented law courses. I suggested creating a course named Structuring Venture Capital, Private Equity and Entrepreneurial Transactions. He asked me to implement the concept. So about, 24, about 25 years ago, I began to teach a course by that name at U of C. And after several years teaching the course, I wrote a book by that name. As John said, it's about a 1,400-page book after the updating that goes on once a year. I was thinking I'd put this on the floor and make you stand on it. Is that, is that <laughs> I'd the way get a lot taller right. then. Maybe I could play basketball. Um, <laughs> um, and I still teach the course at U of C every spring semester. Then about 15 years ago, Harvard Law School asked me if I would teach the same course at Harvard, and I've done so approximately every other winter term for about 20 years. So over the last 25 years, I've enjoyed immensely indoctrinating thousands of young minds in the devious art of combining complex business, legal, tax, and accounting concepts. Meanwhile, about 20 years ago, my very good friend, Martin D. Ginsburg, whose wife, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, has a better job in Washington, asked me to co-author with him a treatise to be entitled Mergers, Acquisitions, and Buyouts. When Marty and I first published the treatise, it was one volume in length. But as we updated and republished it approximately every six months for the last 20 years. In Hawaii, I think, Jack. Isn't that where you guys always uh, We did a lot of updating in Hawaii. You're right. The, the treatise grew from one volume to two volumes to three volumes to four volumes to five volumes and now contains 5,000 printed pages. To be honest, I don't think, Richard... Doesn't that look like the Obamacare bill? Is that how big it was? <laughs> Richard, I, to, to be completely frank, I don't think anyone has ever read any of those books. Oh, I have, Jack. But every, writing every, them every gave page. me something gratifying to do between deals. Right. Well, we started out by saying it, and, I, and, I, and certainly I take a lot of pride in working for you all these years, and, and I certainly do see you as one of the folks that um, is properly credited with being the father of private equity, but um, what are some of the reasons why you've gained that reputation? What are some of the innovations uh, in private equity that you played a role in, in developing? Well, first of all, Richard, it was mere luck that I was around at the dawn of the private equity industry in the mid-70s and that I've managed to stay afloat for the last 35 years. Second, to the extent that I was actually part of laying the pipework that feeds today's private equity industry, I really share that honor with a number of other attorneys who negotiated and battled, as lawyers often do, through decades of deals to help establish the legal tax and structuring solutions. <coughs> but to mention two of the issues where I participated in the heavy lifting. As you probably know, Richard, pension funds as a group are and have long been the largest investors in private equity funds. 
So without pension fund money, the private equity industry would have far less clout. Well, many years ago, the U.S. Department of Labor, God love them, decided that it had jurisdiction to regulate America's pension plans. And that private equity investing was simply too risky for any pension plan to engage in. So the Department of Labor proposed complex regulations that would essentially have cut off the flow of pension money into private equity funds. I was one of the lawyers representing the industry who spent several years successfully fighting those odious regulations. As a result of our efforts, the private equity interest industry today is far better funded and more robust than it would have been. A second example is the structure and economics of a private equity fund itself. It's easy to say private equity fund. It's even easy to say two and 20. But if you've ever looked at the actual contractual terms and architecture of a private equity fund, and the math that goes into calculating the 2% management fee and the 20% carried interest, you would see tremendous variety and tremendous complexity. Now, I was lucky to be one of those lawyers who participated in developing the early terms, the mathematics, the SEC compliance concepts for private equity funds, and the various formulas for calculating the carried interest compensation to the private equity individuals. So, Jack, we're now emerging from um, really the worst recession of my professional lifetime. And, and mine, too. Uh, um, and, you know, the private equity industry was filled with deals that were carrying a lot of leverage. And I think a lot of people thought that might be the end of the private equity industry, uh, that recession. But uh, we're coming out of that now. How do you see things turning now? As I mentioned earlier, back when I first began to practice transactional law, there were very limited sources for a startup business to get early or middle stage funding, or even for an established business to get expansion funding. Only after private equity and venture capital funds and junk bonds burst onto the scene, first in the U.S. and later in other countries to a lesser extent, was there money for early stage startups, for less than industrial quality businesses and for troubled turnarounds. Now the availability of private equity venture capital and junk bond money has always fluctuated. More plentiful when the economy is booming and less plentiful during a recession. That's the inherent nature of a free market capitalistic economy. So since the mid 70s, each of the four or five times our economy has faltered, and as you said, this was the worst that I've seen. The doomsday folks have screamed, it's the end of VC, it's the end of private equity, it's the end of junk bonds. And each time as the economy recovers from a recession, these financial instruments come back strong. Indeed, these types of financial transactions are now basic building blocks of our American economy, which incidentally makes American business far more entrepreneurial than businesses in other countries. But make no mistake, Richard, many other countries are in the process of trying to catch up. That is to develop entrepreneurial e economies more like the U.S.'s. However, I firmly believe that here in the U.S. and to a lesser extent in a number of other advanced countries, private equity, venture capital, junk bonds, and similar entrepreneurial financing are and will remain a basic and permanent element of the business climate. Stated differently, these forms of financing are here to stay. You know, Jack, as I listen to your story and I also think about the history of private equity, it does strike me that um, government has stepped in and, and tried to block its formation a number of times over the course of the years. And uh, it's really remarkable the level of achievement we have given the hostility there, that there is in government. Would you say that government's been um, as supportive as it uh, should have been during that period of time? Well, government seldom views its role with respect to any industry as being supportive. Rather, government looks at every industry as trying to avoid regulation, trying to cut corners, trying to maximize profits at the expense of the consumer, the worker, the public, the tax collector. And hence, our capitalistic system automatically and inevitably generates a constant struggle. 
between any industry and the government agencies which seek to regulate that industry. For example, the tax collector is constantly trying to find reasons to disallow a private equity portfolio company's deductions for stepped-up asset basis arising out of an LBO or for yield paid on the loans borrowed to finance the LBO. And as Congress year after year makes the tax laws more and more complex by populating the law with more and more vague and ambiguous clauses, more and more creative arguments against the tax deductions ar out of a, arising out of an LBO are advanced. Another example is the private equity professional's typical 20% carried interest, as John mentioned, in the fund's long-term capital gains. Although the tax law has always taxed the private equity professional's 20% carry as capital gain, that is the lower capital gain rate, most Democrats have, for at least the last five years, been fighting to change the tax law so that the private equity professional's carried interest in, is taxed as ordinary income. Another point of struggle between industry and government that I think is inevitable. A third and even more timely example is the 2010 Dodd-Frank Act's treatment of private equity fund sponsors. Although there's no evidence that the 2007 to 2010 Dodd um, recession was in any way attributable to the private equity industry, the Dodd-Frank Act designed as a response to the recession, repealed the Investment Advisors Act clause, which exempted most private equity funds, general partners, from registering under the Investment Advisors Act. So that virtually all private equity fund sponsors will shortly be required to register with SEC and subjected to heavy regulation. Right now, no less than seven government agencies, including SEC, are debating how stringent these new regulations will be. So in summary, Richard, government does not see itself as anti-business, but rather as fulfilling a God-ordained duty to protect the public, that is, the people who breathe air, drink water, eat food, borrow money, and make investments from businesses that are dishonest, cavalier, or sloppy. And odious characters like Bernie Madoff and Alan Stanford and Mark Dreyer, whom we've all read about in the Wall Street Journal, inevitably create an insatiable, insatiable desire on government's part to regulate even more strictly than before. So I think it's just inevitable that there are going to be these wrestling, tussling matches between government and each industry. So, Jack, uh, it's pretty clear, I think, still today that you uh, love your career. As you look back, is there any aspect of it you would change in terms of the focus or uh, what you would have done as you came through the, through the ranks? Actually, not at all. I believe what I've done was exactly the right mix of intellectual challenge and practical execution for me. However, in all honesty, as I look back on my career, I see nothing special that I've done to justify this ACG award. I've merely punched the clock every day and done my best to help my private equity venture capital clients improve the business climate for all of us. But I, I would like to end this little talk with a riddle. Are, are you ready? There are four people sitting around at a table here. And they're playing poker. And there's $250 in American currency sitting on the table. Now the four people are first, a high-priced lawyer. Second, a low-priced lawyer. Third, a congressional leader from one political party who is willing and anxious to work in harmony with the congressional leaders from the other political party in order to make our country a better and more harmonious place. And fourth, is Santa Claus. At that moment, the lights go out. And when the lights come back on, the $250 that was sitting on the table is gone. Now the question is, who took the money? Now everybody out there who thinks that it was the high-priced lawyer, hold up your hand. 
Everybody who thinks it was the low price lawyer, hold up your hand. Everybody who thinks it was the congressional leader who wanted the two parties to work together in harmony for the betterment of our country, hold up your hand. Everybody who thinks it was Santa Claus, hold up your hand. Well, the answer is that it was the high priced lawyer because the other three are a figment of your imagination. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Jack.